This is chapter 8, the appendicular skeleton. As we all know, there are 206 bones in the human body, 80 of which belong to the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton has 126 bones, which allows us to move and manipulate objects. It includes all the bones besides the axial skeleton, which include the limbs and your supportive girdle. So what does this mean? To manipulate objects, we have arms and legs. We can walk, we can also move things with our hands and arms. Those are our four major limbs. Supportive girdles are sections of the body that allow the most movement. We're talking the shoulder and also your hip and your knees. Here we have a picture of the appendicular skeleton. Starting from the top, you have the clavicle, which is your collarbone. The scapula is your shoulder blade. The humerus is your upper arm bone where the biceps inserts. The radius is the lateral forearm bone which inserts to your thumb. The ulna is the actual forearm bone medially which inserts to the elbow and extends distally to become the pinky side. The carpals in your bone are eight bones. You have proximal and you have distal rows, a total of eight short wrist bones. The metacarpals are the five major bones that make the palm of your hand. The phalanges are the 14 bones located in each hand and also your feet. These are known basically as your fingers and creation of knuckles. The hip bone is one solid mass which is created or divided, should I say, into three different parts. Now as we move down to the lower body, you have the femur, which is the largest bone in the human body and it basically absorbs most of the weight and movement. The patella is a sesamoid bone located in the middle of your knee which allows you to track the knee. The tibia is known as the shin bone. It is the largest bone of the lower leg providing stability. The little bone to its side is the fibula and the fibula allows assistance to standing, walking, running. It is also the part where uh, muscles attached to the lower part of the ankle. The tarsal bones are about 14 bones, which anything concludes of the calcaneus all the way to the cuneiforms, which we'll talk about later. The metatarsal bones, there are five in each foot, and metatarsal bones basically provide the arch of the foot to make you flat-footed or high-arched. And again, the phalanges, there are about 14 phalanges inside your single foot, and that includes all the bones of the toes. The pectoral girdle, known as the shoulder girdle, connects your arms to the body. It positions your shoulders and provides a base for arm movement. It is basically made up of your clavicle and the scapula, which connects to the entire axial skeleton only at the manubrium. It is also known as the collarbone, and it's a long S-shaped bone. It does begin at the sternal end of the manubrium, and articulates with the scapula. So basically, this is where your shoulder moves. Let's take a look at this picture. Uh, the scapula is located right behind your right thoracic cage or your rib cage. And as you can see, the clavicle connects the sternum at the manubrium and to the scapula. Um, it's quite important to stabilize your shoulder muscles as well. Uh, the humerus is located there. It's connecting into the glenoid fossa, which allows your arm to have the biggest range of motion of all joints. Here's a picture of the actual clavicle from a top view. The medial view shows where it inserts into the manubrium or the sternum and then you have the acromial end on the left side which actually hooks into your shoulder or your scapula. The scapula is known as the shoulder blades. It's a broad flat triangle and as you can recall it is also known as a flat bone. It moves with the arm and the collarbone and basically is responsible for movement of above and below horizontal and transverse movements. The body has three sides, the superior border, the medial border, and the lateral border. Simply put, superior means the top, medial is the inside towards the heart, and lateral is outside. The process is the glenoid cavity. By the way, what is the glenoid cavity? It is basically a uh, connection joint where the humerus inserts into the shoulder. There you will find the coracoid process and the acromion which are basic shapes and landmarks from the shoulder blade. Let's take a look at this picture here. 
This is your typical scapula, and let's start from the top. The acromion and the coracoid process are these extensions that help to grip your humerus head. The superior border is basically what it is. It's the above top border of the scapula. It does have a superior angle, which is the height of its bone, landmarks. Um, the body is basically the largest size of the, the entire scapula. The lateral border is what's on the outside, and your medial border is towards your heart. The inferior angle is known as the lowest section or point of the scapula. This is a view from the medial aspect, and the most important thing for you to know is the glenoid cavity. The thing that is right in the middle of the picture, it's a flat surface, that is where the head of the humus inserts so that you can have arm motion. Uh, now you're looking at the back, or should we say posterior sides. It is important to note, the supraspinous fossa is the area where the supraspinous muscle inserts, one of the four major rotator cuffs. And as you can see, the acromion exerts laterally, superiorly, to meet the glenoid of the humerus. Uh, the spine is uh, basically the part of the scapula you can actually touch. Again, there's the body and the rest of the sections and landmarks. The scapular spine is, again, the ridge that we just talked about, has separating two regions, the above and below, number one and two fossas. The upper limb does consist of your arms, your forearms, your wrists, and your hands. That is one limb. The humerus is known as your basic arm, the upper arm, and it articulates in the pelvic shoulder girdle. It does have a shaft, which is the long part of the bone, and there's a deltoid tuberosity, which is basically uh, the attachment where your deltoid muscle is. The radial groove is important because the nerve, known as the radial nerve, inserts through there. The humerus does have a distal epiphysis. It has the medial and the lateral epicondyles. This is where muscles attach, and you have the condyles of the humerus, which allows movement between the ulna and the radius, which means your elbow. The articular regions of the condyles, the trochlea is a smooth end, the capitulum is a double smooth end, which we'll see in a second. Now, here we go. This is a picture of your upper arm known as the humerus. The head is located at the top. Uh, the neck is very small compared to the femur. Um, the shaft is where the deltoid tuberosity is. And what does that mean? That's where the deltoid muscle inserts, which allows abduction of the shoulder. Down below, you have the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle. Those two parts of the bone you can touch. That's the part of the bone that sticks out in your elbow. The capitulum and the trochlear make up the smooth condyle where the elbow